Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes, and welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings, and, uh, as you may note, we are back to books about Siamese cats. Um, I, I've decided that, uh, that this particular cat will be, will be my opener for all of these books, because I lack the creativity to think of a better one. Um, so today's book... Today's Cat Who book, rather, in Quillerish Ramblings, is The Cat Who Saw Red. Um, so, this book, this particular one, picks up right after the last Cat Who book, but Lillian Braun picked up this series about 20 years later. The first three books in the series were all set in, but also, uh were written in the late 60s. This one was actually picked up during the 80s. And, uh, so the uh, actual copyright date is 1986. And so when I, and so when you're reading this, there's potentially a little bit of a a tonal change. It's a very small tonal change, and you wouldn't really notice it because it's the same author, same character, same place, but there's a tiny little tonal change that indicates that shift between the 1960s and the 1980s and how people saw things and talked about women and various other things. It's possible, of course, that she's mellowing Quillerin as he ages, but it's only been a few years, and he hasn't really aged all that much. So, The Cat Who Saw Red continues with our theme of Quillerin and the Daily Fluxion. This time, Quillerin gets thrown headlong into uh, writing about food. Now, he doesn't object to the food thing on the basis that he's neither interested nor knows anything about it, because Quillerin, for all that he doesn't cook and is not a chef, um, what he lacks in that he more than makes up for in paying attention to things, and certainly this book, as much as the others, and perhaps more because, of course, he's actually supposed to be reviewing food, uh, continues to talk about the food a lot. It really is one of the important well, interesting things that happens in these books is that just this constant returning focus on what the food is like, how good or bad it is, and what's in it. In this, Quillerin uh, winds up getting assigned to the food beat just as he is supposed to go on a diet, and uh, there is a certain amount of repetitious noting uh, during the course of the book that he is trying not to break his diet. But, um, honestly, the diet isn't really all that important beyond one or two, you know, wisecracks, um, over the fact that he's not eating a lot and people make note of it for various reasons. Um, but what happens in this one is this is actually a lot darker, and I mean, they're all murder mysteries, but this is darker, um, because in this one, Quillerin meets up with a woman who he was once engaged to many moons ago, 20 years before, and he meets, uh, Joy Graham Nay Wheatley, and she's, She's the same as she ever was, but she's been married for many years to this horrible man, Dan Graham, and and Quillerin sort of immediately falls back in love with her, that it's sort of that whole thing where he sees her again and it's as though no time has passed, and she tells him she's getting a divorce, in, in confidence she tells him, and then asks and then says, in despair, that she needs money because, of course, she needs to be able to pay a divorce lawyer to help her with that and these sorts of things. 
And so Quillerin, against his better judgment, gives her $750, which let's keep in mind that this is the 1960s, and during the 1960s, a $12,000 a year uh, income was actually a really, really solid middle class income. Um, like, that, that money was worth more then, worth a lot more. So giving her $750 is a tremendous amount. Um, it's even more tremendous given that Quillerin has been living in poverty up until recently and indeed doesn't have a lot of money himself. So when he forks over a bunch of prize money he just won from the Daily Fluxion, well, that was a lot of money and perhaps not the brightest move he ever made. Um, and that's, it's the next day that the mystery starts because the next day... Joy goes missing, and her husband keeps on insisting that she's left for Florida, which Quillerin strongly believes in a, is a lie because she's always said she hated Florida. And as we go through this book, there's the usual cast of quirky characters. There's Hixie Rice, who is another one of those characters who becomes a semi-regular in future. Um, and... The uh, lawyer, Robert Mouse, who also, in the distant future, becomes something of a semi-regular. What happens at the start of this also is that Quillerin winds up at the Mouse House, M-A-U-S House, which is, which is sort of a weird boarding house for foodie types. Um, and by weird boarding house for foodie types, I mean that Robert Mouse only rents places, leases places out, apartments out to people who are connected with food. And Quillerin just barely makes the grade as a newspaper food writer. Um, and he, he's, his being there, um, it allows him to basically to watch the cast of characters living in this new place, because e each of these books, we get our new cast of characters not only by virtue of where, uh, of where Quillerin is writing, but also where he's living. And Quill, he, uh, his being there really does wind up sparking off a whole bunch of things. And what's really, really interesting at the end of this is that this is really the one book that personally I found that this was the one that had the most horrifying murder. Like, it, it, the, most of these books have murders in them, and most of those murders are serious. Um, I mean, one or two just have major theft, but most of them have murders, and, you know, murder is generally a, a terrifying, horrible thing. But this is the one where it's, I think, possibly the most cold-blooded murder that we have in the series, that I recall seeing in the series. Most of the murders in the series tend to be personal. They tend to be somebody was killed in the heat of the moment, or somebody was killed in fear that it would ruin a reputation, or any number of other things like that. And in this one, uh, this is the spoiler, the all spoilers all the time zone. Keep that in mind. Um, in this one, the murders are committed by the murderer. By Dan Graham, he murders first his wife's cat and then his wife. And then a nice young man named William, who is kind of a... A, a gopher type in, in Mouse House. That is, he sort of does, uh, you know, a bit of grunt work in the kitchen and a bit of house, you know, uh, handy work uh, stuff around the place and, and various things like that. And Mouse... When Dan Graham kills these people, kills his wife, kills the cat, he uses them in order to make a particularly lurid 
red glaze on his pottery. Graham is a potter, as as is his wife Joy, and they they make pottery, and as as an art form. And he's clearly jealous of his wife's skill and talent, and so certainly that factors into it. But when I look at this, there's something tremendously horrifyingly cold about killing his wife and using her body to create a particularly impressive red glaze. And that's... And it's fairly clear that the cat's death, the cat's vanishing into the kiln, is the first experiment. And that's what gets me about the cat who saw red. This is... I found the most chilling out of all of the Cat Who books. Because, as I said, most of them, most of them, the murders are immediate and, and personal. And this one didn't feel personal. It felt like pure convenience. And there's the usual red herring in this about another situation that might be connected and might have to do with the murder or missing persons or what have you and turns out to just be its own thing. Um, in this case, that there's a particular uh, restaurant that is trying to drive another restaurant out of business by slander um, and, and Oddly enough, it's just so that they can get the good spot on the corner. They're not even directly in competition. Um, and and it's, it's a red herring in the course of the book. But the Quillerin and, and his old flame, his ex fiance Joy, that's really where a lot, of the, a lot of the emotional power of this book lies. This is... This is less of a funny book than the others. There's a lot of funny, but it's a lot sharper edged in this one. Hixie Rice is is desperate and she just wants to get married and have children and live that, you know, white picket fence 2.5 children with a husband life and nobody wants her, which makes her depressed. So she enters into that horrifying cycle of you eat because you're depressed and you're depressed because you eat which makes you depressed, so you eat more. And she's sharp-tongued and bitter. And Quillerin is very on edge throughout this because of joy. And Dan Graham is uncouth and really, really offensive, uh, almost deliberately so. And there's there are a lot sharper edges in this one, I feel, than in the first three. And this one also stands out to me as compared to later books in the series, which also don't feel as sharp. This this one feels angry, this book. Um, and I, I certainly enjoy the contrast. Um... You know, I enjoy it. It's still a Cat Who book. Coco is still there giving Quillerin clues by looking at things and standing on things and breaking things. And, again, like I said, you have the usual colorful cast of characters. Uh, you know, one woman who doesn't... Who, who who doesn't like anything. She doesn't like drinking or sex or you know, anything that has even the remotest hint of impropriety, and, uh, as I said, Hixie, who is overweight and sharp-tongued and very funny, and Robert Mouse, who is the lawyer who really ought to be a gourmet chef. You have all of those characters, but you have this bitter undertone that runs through the whole book that really makes it stand out from the others. Um... So, I I recommend this as I recommend the rest of the series, but with the caveat that you'll probably find it a little bit darker than most. 
Thanks for coming. <laughs>